So where do we stand now? Well, we have good news and we have bad news. Uh, the good news is NFIB is perfectly delighted that these two bills seem to be stalled. I stress seem to be stalled right now. And I don't think I have to go through a litany of why it is that we're pleased. Uh, suffice to say, uh, they were going to end up with centralized micromanagement of the health care system. But uh, for our guys, for small business, perhaps even more so, these bills, as they were finally crafted in the end, uh, would have created tremendous uncertainty, almost limitless capacity for unintended consequences. Now let's look back over the last 15 years. Uh, I make a point, I speak to a lot of fairly conservative audiences. I, I spoke to an overwhelmingly conservative Republican uh, business audience last week in San Antonio, and after uh, they went through a little bit of giddiness, I then said, okay, now there's a problem though. In the 15 years or so since Clinton Care died, conservatives have really been quite timid, quite passive, on health care, and they shouldn't be. I can, we can discuss what all the political reasons are, but they shouldn't be. Uh, health care, left as it is currently, is a th threat to long-term viability of American business, in particular small business. Uh, it's a threat to the American economy, and a lot of good work comes out of Heritage here on, uh, on exactly what we have in store with Medicare and Medicaid down the road. And frankly, if we don't fix these things, one of these days, Liberals will get a big bill through. We may have dodged the comet this time, but it will swing back around. Now, I would say also that the easiest fixes for the small group and the individual markets for what's wrong with them happen to be, whether you are a conservative or a liberal, they happen to be market-based approaches. Conservatives are well positioned to take the lead in this, and they have that opportunity right now. Uh, Big advantage that I see in this, other than our members, our 350,000 members suddenly get a lot happier than they are today, is that if you fix the problems of small business, you will diffuse many of the left's complaints, many of the things that make it likely that that comet is going to come back and strike us one of these days. And by the way, I think a lot of the left's complaints on it happen to be valid. I happen to disagree with the solutions, but the complaints, by and large, when you're getting into coverage issues, cost issues, quality issues, uh, portability issues, they have valid points. The NFIB is the voice for the small businesses. How is that related to the health care reform right now? Most of the problems of health care in the United States really are at their worst in small business. Our guys, it, it costs more for them to purchase health insurance for their employees than it does for big firm or for government. Uh, they have fewer choices. Typically, an employee in a small business has only one, one possible choice of insurance plan. Uh, our small businesses are not experts in health insurance, and yet they're required to make all of these decisions. And so we think, we have a slogan that says, uh, when it's fixed for small business, it's fixed for America. We sincerely believe that, that really when you, when you solve the health care problems for small business, you've done most of the job. Is there a particular idea that you are promoting to achieve this end? There are lots of, lots of ideas that we've pushed. Uh, by the way, we have a, uh, we have a website, NFIB.com, and we have a dedicated health care website that you can find through there that has lots of ideas. One of the items that we were pushing right at the end of the drafting of the Senate bill that went through, you know, we were in opposition to the bill itself. There was an interesting idea that bubbled up toward the end, and it was called the, and I'm going to hope that I do this right, the Wyden Collins by Optional Free Choice Voucher Amendment. What this would have done was essentially, a lot, right now, a small health and a small business purchases a health insurance plan, one size fits all, and all the employees are given the option, here's the plan, take it or leave it. What this would have done would, would have been to allow a small business instead of this, to instead of giving them an insurance policy, to give them a voucher. This would have been a pre-tax quantity of money that they could have then used, the employees could have then used to purchase their own policies, policies that were 
uh, good for their families and not necessarily for other families in, in the business. Uh, this, so this would have had a lot of advantages and we think might well have solved a number of the, the major problems in the healthcare system. For instance, a small business employee would suddenly become an informed consumer. I can buy that policy or that policy or that policy rather than here's the policy. And that would have required them to become a bit educated as consumers. It also would have meant that they would have had a portability that they do not enjoy now. Right now you leave your employer, you have to hope that you don't have a pre-existing illness because it's going to be very hard for you to get uh, to get insurance if you become unemployed or if you move to a different state. There are lots of problems in that way. Uh, this would have said, this is my insurance policy, not my employer's. If I leave employment, if I become unemployed or if I go to another employer, I can carry my insurance with me just as I do my auto insurance uh, or, or all sorts of other benefits like that. So we think this really would have gone a long way toward uh, making a much better world for both the employers and the employees. It would have solved a lot of the, the problems, at least at the small end of the market, that uh, people over on Capitol Hill uh, tend to worry a lot about. Um, so this is funny because we already have about, um, well not about, we have 69 federal preschool programs in existence today. So it appears that uh, the administration thinks that this 70th preschool program is going to be the magic bullet that solves the you know, big preschool crisis, which doesn't exist. Um, we spend about $25 billion annually on federal preschool programs. So this is a whole new, this is $9.3 billion over 10 years, but it is a significant new investment in preschool. That's coming out of the Department of Ed's budget. Over at HHS, their budget includes um, a $1 billion increase to Head Start. I don't know if anyone um, has followed the Head Start brouhaha lately, or it hasn't been much of a brouhaha actually because no one's covering it, but the Federal Head Start program, they uh, just released, HHS just released their first grade follow-up study. So they followed all of these little preschoolers that were three-year-olds and four-year-olds that went through the Federal Head Start program and found that there was zero lasting impact, no significant impact whatsoever on kids that went through Head Start. So children are actually better off if they stayed at home, these are low-income children, than if they went through the Federal Head Start program. So to, despite all of this information, we know Head Start doesn't work whatsoever, no lasting impacts through first grade. They added a $1 billion increase to the program in HHS. So you have to bear in mind, this is coming from an administration that promised to do what works, quote, uh, in education. So while they are expanding funding for Head Start, which we clearly know doesn't work, in fact, uh, HHS, who released the study, found a significantly statistically significant negative impact on math, a negative impact on math. We know Head Start doesn't work whatsoever. They're expanding funding for it. At the same time, back on K-12, they're ending funding for the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program like Rob mentioned. Um, it's been funded at $12 million a year. This is part of a three-sector approach that provided funding to the DC public schools, the DC charter schools, and then the DC OSP. It's been going along since 2004, $12 million. We know kids are learning better. They do, in fact, show statistically significant improvements in academic achievement. Their parents are happier. There are all these great gains. Um, and they reduced funding for it in the president's budget down to $9 million. And not only that, we knew the president was planning to phase out the DCOSP, but this $9 million in the budget is the last $9 million forever. So the kids that are in the program now, this is all they have to sustain their scholarships until graduation. Some of these kids are in kindergarten. So um, it's just really disingenuous, and it really does show that it's not about what works, um, as the administration has claimed in education, expanding programs that don't work and killing those that do. So, What we've been doing for the past five years is trying to document uh, what do you get out of a college education. And what we've been, how we've been doing that is assessing what college students know going into college and what they know going out of college. And so... Uh, there's been previous reports, which this uh, PowerPoint uh, details, uh, essentially at, at like universities like Yale and, and uh, Georgetown, where I went to school, the freshmen know more than the seniors on the same test. And we're talking about things like what's federalism, what are the three branches of government, what is NATO, uh, wh what, what are the Federalist Papers, basic things like that. This year, what we did was, all right, college isn't doing a very good job teaching basic subjects. What else are they influencing in terms of civic life? And so we actually asked uh, 
college graduates uh, a battery of questions uh, that kind of undergird some perennial policy debates in this country and also their perceptions about uh, America in general. And what we found was that if you go to college, you are much more likely to favor abortion on demand, uh, same-sex marriage, you're against school prayer, you believe that you're less likely to believe that with hard work and perseverance you can succeed in America, and, uh, oh, and, that the, and you are more skeptical that the Bible is the word of God. Uh, other than that, there was no impact on college on things like ec free market economics uh, and, and education issues, generally speaking. So that's what's contained in this report. What do we draw from this? Actually, if you do better on our test, if you're more civically literate, you actually have a greater respect for America's free institutions. You, uh, you support the free market more. You believe that the Ten Commandments are relevant. There's about 20 different propositions that you actually, um, uh, that higher civic knowledge actually has an impact on. So what we think uh, this proves for the first time empirically is what everyone around this room kind of knows in their gut instinct, is that uh, faculty members in a lot of elite universities are far <coughs> left of center to the American public. But what we've not been able to prove is what that, how that influences public opinion. And so the, for the first time, we think, empirically, we can, um, we can state that uh, a college education makes uh, graduates uh, le more hostile and, and less sympathetic to some core principles that I think we, we hold uh, as, as not just conservatives, but, uh, but as Americans.